Farmers and others in Nova Scotia get fair prices. We consulted with pharmacies, including rural pharmacies, and we will have a plan that will serve this province very well, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle on your first supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know from the Ontario experience that reducing the price of some generic drugs has meant manufacturers simply stop making them. Uh, what has the minister done to ensure that the drugs Nova Scotians need will still be available after her legislation is enacted? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the shortage of generic drugs is complex and can't be attributed merely to the initiatives that have been taken in Ontario and in fact other provinces have taken initiatives as well and are in the process of doing so. Um, but as I said, our plan will be a Made in Nova Scotia plan, a plan that was developed with a great deal of consultation with a broad spectrum of um, groups including pharmacies, pharmacists, uh, seniors organizations and others and I'm very much looking forward uh, to unveiling this plan in the not so distant future Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle on your final supplementary. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker. The effect of lower drug prices will inevitably mean lower profits for pharmacists at a time when the government is expanding the scope of practice for pharmacists. How much of the drug price savings will the minister use to compensate pharmacists for the new services that they will soon perform for Nova Scotians when she, uh, when she will roll up her sleeve, uh, when will she roll up her sleeve and develop a, a tariff or a fee schedule uh, for those folks that are going to be offering these great services uh, that they've asked for and the department has asked for as well? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we believe in treating all sectors of our health care sector fairly, Mr. Speaker, with respect to compensation. And Mr. Speaker, pharmacists have <coughs> been um, a group in our health care system that have a much greater capacity to provide services to Nova Scotia than they've had an opportunity to do. And the work that we will in, engage on and we're embarking on with this uh, really important group of health care providers is going to see a real benefit uh, for pharmacists, but more importantly, I think, for members of our community and people who rely on their services. That's our objective, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in June uh, 2010, the Minister of the Environment promised concerned citizens in the Hillside Trenton area that a health study would be conducted on fly ash emissions from the Trenton Power Station and the impact on the health of residents in that area. As we get close to June 2011, almost a year, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister please tell us where is the study? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the member opposite, I think there, there is a disconnect or a misunderstanding here. I met with the, the members of uh, Trenton, and there was discussion around a study that was being conducted by Health and Wellness, and I think there's a misunderstanding there. And uh, truly, uh, we met with them people, we discussed their issues, and uh, I look forward to meeting with them as we have done in the past, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on your first supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think there was any misunderstandings by the residents there on what the Minister said, but he did, on March 24, 2011, many months later, write an email to the residents saying he, in fact, had nothing to do with the, the study that he announced would start at that June meeting, and the one he was talking about was already underway at the Department of Health Promotion and Protection. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Health and Wellness is where is that study, and when will it be released to the public? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I haven't uh, had an opportunity to meet with the residents from uh, the Trenton area. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, they, uh, if they request a meeting with me, I certainly would be prepared to meet with them. Um, I understand that the Medical Officer of Health for that District Health Authority 
has in fact been uh, involved in this issue and has it well in hand with respect to whether or not there is in fact a need for a study, whether or not this is a public health issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth Eat on your final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think there's a lot of residents in those areas that will be very surprised to hear the Minister say that, since I will table emails from the Minister of the Environment claiming the Minister of Health already had the study underway, and a letter from the Minister of Health claiming the Minister of Environment already is, is responsible for this. So, And they copied one another on that email, so I'm surprised that the Minister of Health seems to know nothing about this. And Mr. Speaker, furthermore, uh, the fact is that in these emails, it's with the tacit, it is with the tacit support of the members from Picto Center, Picto West, and Picto East, all of whom were also copied on these emails uh, about regarding these studies. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll return to the Minister of the Environment. Uh, so one of them must know what's going on here. Would you please tell the members of this house and the people of Pictou County, since you, since Mr. Speaker, this minister told those residents this study was already underway. Will the minister take responsibility for the study and tell us when it will be completed and released to the public? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member opposite. Again, I point out that I, I believe that there's a sincere, there's a misunderstanding here. We met with the people in that particular area and uh, we referred to the study that was being conducted through the Health and Wellness Department. And I, I, I take full responsibility of that. I met with them people, and uh, it's sure it's a case of misunderstanding. So we're here, our staff has been working with that community, and we'll continue to work with that community, community and we'll look forward to in the future. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Oh, that's a new question. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, um, this question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, yesterday, uh, in a sort of odd and unusual joint statement, uh, the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Environment announced that they will do an environmental review on hydraulic fracking. Now, obviously, Mr. Speaker, at the time, uh, and I say today, we're very happy to see the government finally take on that review. I asked for the government to conduct such a review last August and again in the fall, as well as put a moratorium on permits during that review, both in last August and in the fall. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'd be remiss if I didn't note the fact that it did not include a moratorium on the issuance of any permits, unlike all other jurisdictions in North America which are currently doing reviews. So Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy, why did he not put a moratorium on the issuance of industrial permits for hydraulic fracturing during the review process? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Um, the um, moratorium uh, in the province of Quebec, uh, actually, uh, it's only on uh, new uh, uh, developments, and uh, there's actually 31 wells uh, that are still being hydraulically uh, fractured. But here in Nova Scotia, we have none. We have no applications for uh, uh, this process, and uh, doesn't, I wouldn't say there's any on the agenda during the period of time that we're going to be doing the study. So, uh, um, really, there's, uh, there's no need for it. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on your first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Mr. Minister of Energy just gave the reason why there should be a moratorium on the issuance of permits, because Quebec ran into an issue where they couldn't put a moratorium on projects that were already underway yet, just as the Minister said, there are no applications there yet, so you put the moratorium in so industry knows what the rules are. Mr. Speaker, I'll follow up with the Minister of the Environment. As Minister of the Environment, why did this Minister not not demand that there be a moratorium on the in issuance of industrial permits for hydraulic fracturing while the review is taking place. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, again uh, to the member opposite. Well, first of all, I want to tell you to the member opposite that I have the greatest confidence in the joint uh, council or the committee that is working on this. And uh, these people are senior staff. They understand this issue. They're going to go out and gather information from all other jurisdictions. And I'll repeat what the Minister of Energy just said. There is no urgency to this issue. We are taking the right approach, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to add a footnote to this. Since there are media release on this subject as of last night, our neighboring province from PEI has shown interest in our leadership. Mr. Speaker, that is a very good comment when you have a neighboring province promising 
province recognizing leadership on an issue that is protecting our environment. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his final supplementary. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, Mr. Speaker, that the, uh, the Minister of Environment doesn't think there's any urgency to this issue. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of Nova Scotians who feel otherwise, and I'm sure he's received uh, the emails and phone calls, and, and I think certainly the Minister of Energy uh, understands firsthand from his, uh, the demonstration at his constituency office. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to uh, my, direct my final supplementary to the Minister of Energy. The other thing missing in this is there is no timeline on the completion of this review. Now, we know this government has a history of missing deadlines. Deadlines uh, for 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 everything from gambling studies to natural resource studies to wetland studies, all of which have been overdue. Yet, Mr. Speaker, why is it that this government would not put a deadline for the completion of this review? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we actually, in the press release, said yesterday the, the study will be done uh, by early uh, 2012, and with that, we'll be consulting with Nova Scotians. We'll be uh, listening to um, experts in the field, and uh, we will uh, uh, use the best resources to get the best possible regulations to protect Nova Scotians uh, and their drinking water. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question through you is to the Minister responsible for natural resources. Your government has been discussing a new natural resources strategy since June of 2009. I asked the Premier and the former Minister of Natural Resources last fall for a definition of clear-cutting, and neither, neither could come up with, the right, with an answer. Will the new Minister of Natural Resources today Please give his definition of clear cutting. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, clear cutting is an issue in Nova Scotia. We made a full commitment that we're going to uh, uh, reduce clear cutting in, the, in this province by 50% uh, within a five year period. We're uh, absolutely sticking to that. There are, understand, there are many different definitions of what clear cutting is. And um, we're, we're listening to Nova Scotians to see uh, what they determine that the clear cutting should, should be defined as. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West on his first supplementary. Very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have to admit, even though the former minister didn't give an answer, it was better than that one. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, the Ecology Action Centre, the Federation of Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners, the Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and Operators Association do not think a general ban on clear cutting is a viable option for forest management in Nova Scotia. Last October, these leaders in Nova Scotia forest industry defined a clear cut as, and I quote, the final harvest of a stand of trees that removes most of or the entire overstory when either of the two following conditions are met. One, the area of the stand is reduced to a stocking level below the sea line threshold of acceptable growing stock. And two, an opening in the canopy is created that is greater than twice the height of the surrounding trees, measuring as the diameter of a circle or the narrow side of a rectangular block. Question. Well, uh, it's hard to ask a question, question if you don't give me time to finish the, 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 the get the right information. <laughs> but the question is, the question is, of course, Mr. Speaker, does the minister agree with these people who manage the forests of this province? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I agree that that's one definition of what clear cutting might entail, but there, if you talk to Nova Scotians, you talk to foresters, you talk to uh, environmentalists, there's different definitions of what a clear cut means. And uh, we're going to continue to work with Nova Scotians as we develop our natural resources strategy. We're going to uh, come forward with um, the definition of that, and we'll have a working group uh, uh, of all stakeholders to determine exactly what forest policy see, policies we should be following in this province, including uh, a definition of uh, clear cutting. And uh, we uh, will very sh uh, shortly have a, a, a better handle on, on, on what exactly uh, is included in the, our natural resources strategy. So stay tuned, and uh, you'll, you'll get your answer. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if the Minister doesn't agree with the definition of clear cut, will you not provide a definition, and, 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 and you can't provide a definition? Order, how, order, please. 
The time allotted for oral questions put by members has run out. Before I, before I um, finish up after question period, I, I must uh, first of all say apologize to the member from Kings West and what his, his trust was, as I said, it was unparliamentary, which I must admit I was wrong. The point I was trying to make in that question period was that members are only supposed to refer to other members in the third person, usually by their position. The member, you know, or the minister of, you know, not his or her or you. And that was happening quite a bit today in question period, so I apologize for the minister from Cape Breton West, and please refer to those ministers or the honorable member for, okay? Thank you. The honorable government host leader. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad that crowd over there is happy now. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could you please call government bills for second reading? Government bills for second reading. Could you please call Bill 1, the Motor Vehicle Act? Bill number 1, the Motor Vehicle Act. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, congratulations on your appointment and congratulations for surviving your first question period. No, that's... You know, many of us, of course, have sat here and, after all, been critical of speakers in the past. And I, the years I've been here, and I know the member from Cape Breton West might have on one occasion before, but a speaker has come forward in the first time during question period and admitted he made a mistake. He's off to a good start, as far as I'm concerned. I have the uh, I have the honour, Mr. Speaker, and to members uh, in in the House today to. Uh, inter to, to speak on Bill Number One, and it is dealing, of course, with an amendment to the uh, Motor Vehicle Act, but more particularly, it deals with impaired driving with children in a vehicle. Now, I've heard some comments about this further to, and I, th I thank the members opposite who did attend the bill briefing. I've heard from some members of the public, of course, who are concerned with one reaction. My goodness, driving while impaired is silly enough. Silly is not the correct word. We should use something stronger. But it's almost scandalous to make the decision if someone is under the influence to be driving with children in the vehicle. But however, I'm pleased to bring this forward. Bill 1 is a piece of legislation that I'm looking forward to seeing, hearing comments from members opposite, to hearing it go through to law amendments, when we, of course, will be hearing from various members of the public, including MAD, who were in attendance at the bill briefing, and of course, members of the police enforcement, and I thank them for attending the bill briefing which had took place on Friday. Mr. Speaker, there is currently no increased penalty for those who choose to drive impaired with children in the vehicle. Not in this province, for sure. This legislation will create tough penalties for drivers convicted of impaired driving where children under the age of 16 were present in the vehicle at the time of the incident. Mr. Speaker, creating penalties for impaired driving and with child passengers demonstrates the seriousness of impaired driving while transporting these young people. This legislation builds on earlier legislation enforcement and awareness initiatives. And I think it would only be appropriate at this time that I congratulate some of the uh, members opposite who were served in government during the past number of years. I know that the member from Cumberland South, the previous member from Cumberland South, I, I'm, I believe, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm uh, permitted to use his name now that he's no longer a member. Uh, the Honourable Murray Scott showed great initiative when it came forward with uh, dealing with the issue of impaired driving. Uh, in fact, it was Murray who, uh, it was Mr. Scott who initially introduced me to Margaret Miller. Margaret Miller was a national president of MAD at the time, and it's only fair to point out that when we deal with an issue of this sort, it goes well beyond political stripes. We're dealing with an issue, we're dealing with a crime, we're dealing with a punishment that must be fitting the, the, the crime, and it's something I'm sure that Mr. Scott, in his retirement, although I hope he's doing more productive things today than watching the Ledge Channel in Spring Hill, Mr. Scott probably would say this is a good piece of legislation, and I'm sure I'll be hearing from him in the weeks and days ahead about this. I'd like to point out the amendments to the Motor Vehicle Act and what they will entail, and it's important that we clarify this. It increases the time a driver's license is revoked by adding another 12 months on top of the current penalty. 
And the Minister of Justice, the Attorney General, attended this bill briefing and clarified in fact, uh, for the media particularly, and I appreciate him being there, the fact that the judge could make the decision of whatever length, but now it's going to be added to by 12 months if there are children present and you're caught drinking and driving. It'll also require first-time offenders to participate in the alcohol ignition interlock program. First-time offenders, they're on the interlock program. It will also increase the minimum requirement of the alcohol inter interlock program by 12 months for all offenders. You know, it's important that as a government and as legislators across this province in all three parties, we send a strong message to Nova Scotians that driving while impaired is absolutely unacceptable and driving while impaired with children present is absolutely scandalous. It is, after all, an absolute crime to consider the fact that you would jeopardize not only your own health and safety, but children also involved in driving or in the vehicle while you were driving under the influence. Mr. Speaker, Manitoba is the only province to have penalties for impaired drivers with child passengers. Impaired driving is the leading cause of vehicle collisions and fatalities and injuries in this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, impaired driving took the lives of 21 Nova Scotians in 2010. 21 Nova Scotians who needlessly died on our highways because of impaired driving. This legislation is part of several initiatives and legislative enforcement and awareness that of course we brought through to this house they include the Alcohol Ignition Interlock Program, Operation Christmas, and most recently, increased penalties for those who drive with a blood alcohol level between 0 0.05 and 0 0.08. But in particular, Mr. Speaker, I must highlight Campaign 911. Mr. Speaker, I am absolutely pleased with the response from the public, and Nova Scotians deserve a round of applause for how they have responded. The number of Nova Scotians who have spotted, under, in their opinion, that someone is under the influence and they have the opportunity to call 91 is absolutely fabulous. It's unfortunate that we have to continue to deal with Nova Scotians because of this unwise decision. But Nova Scotians who have called 911, they certainly have done a great deal when it's come to recognizing how important it is to identify drink, uh, drivers who are drinking under the influence and I encourage them to continue to do this. More than a year after the launch of the program, Nova Scotians to continue to help keep our roads safe by, support, by reporting suspected impaired drivers. Every call makes a difference and on behalf of this government and on behalf of the, the MLAs present, I would like to thank Nova Scotians for taking up this challenge. It is a positive step and it makes certainly the message more and more clear not just legislators, not just the police force, but Nova Scotians are not going to put up with drinking and driving. Mr. Speaker, I'm also encouraged that Nova Scotia has moved up seven places in the most recent provincial ratings released by the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. This province moves from 11th place to 4th and improved its D plus rating in 2006 to a B minus rating in the 2009 report card. And the old teacher in me and the parent also says report cards are important. They do offer a measuring when it comes to how well we've met the expectations of Nova Scotia. I want to assure you, Mr. Speaker, that when Margaret Miller speaks, she's listened to. Margaret Miller, the past national president of MAD, has said on a number of occasions, and I would like to table this, it's important that she is recognized again. This sends a strong message to the people in this province that if they, if I look at the print here, participate in this kind of behavior, they will be punished. I thank Margaret Miller for her support in this particular issue. Ms. Miller, of course, has got personal experience with the issue. Her commitment to MAD is absolutely exemplary. This legislation will help prevent alcohol-related tragedies and the lasting impacts they have on those left behind. Mr. Speaker, this legislation clearly demonstrates the government's commitment to the issue of impaired driving, and we are going to continue to make sure that Nova Scotians get the message through education, they're going to continue to get the message because of enforcement, and they're going to continue to get the information, hopefully, that this is a, a particular crime that is not going to be accepted under any circumstances in this province. I encourage members opposite to participate in this debate. I encourage Nova Scotians to come forward to law amendments 
And I can assure you that this government is absolutely committed to the fact that we will do everything possible to make the roads as safe as possible in this province. With those few comments, I'll take my spot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member for Clare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise and say a few words on bill number one. Uh, order. Oh, I, rec I recognize the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my apologies to the Minister for the member from Clare. Uh, it's been pointed out to me that I did not actually move second reading, so to, I'll, I'll have to do it the correct way next time I move second reading of this bill. I recognize the member for Clare. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise and say a few words on bill number one that's amending the Motor Vehicle Act. First of all, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate the Minister for bringing this piece of legislation forward. Mr. Speaker, we all know that drinking and driving is not allowed on our highways. However, when you look at the statistics uh, released by the Department on accidents and fatalities happening on our roads where alcohol is involved, these numbers keep reminding us that drinking and driving continues to be a major problem on our highways and a leading cause for accidents on our roads. Mr. Speaker, looking at some of these numbers, and again, these numbers speak for themselves. Last year in 2010, 21 people lost their lives in accidents on our highways where drinking and driving was involved. In 2001, and I'll just give you a, a few statistics, uh, Mr. Speaker. In 2001, 31 people lost their lives. 2002, 34 people. 2003, 39. 2004, 22. 2005, 26. 2006, 29. 2007, 32. Now, we all know, Mr. Speaker, that these are preventable accidents. Mr. Speaker, I was also able to find more information that I want to share with you on the accidents involving alcohol on our highways. And I'll just look at the numbers for 2006. I looked at previous years and basically the numbers are in the same ballpark. The total number of coalitions involving alcohol in 2006 was 507 accidents. In 2006, 507 accidents happened on our highways that involved alcohol. The total number of injuries, we talked about the fatalities, the total number of injuries involving alcohol was 318 injuries. Again, Mr. Speaker, these numbers speak for themselves. So they clearly show that drinking and driving continues to be a major problem on our highways. Now, these numbers make us all aware that more prevention work needs to be done. And as legislators, we need to do more work to make our roads safer, as the minister pointed out. One fatality on our roads is still one too many to have. Now, even though, even though we don't have numbers for these, uh, I want to share that, this with you, Mr. Speaker, for the record. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, we all know that not every driver who drinks and drives gets involved in an accident. You know, these, these individuals are lucky. We also know that not every driver who drinks and drives on our highways uh, gets stopped by the police either. So again, you know, these are for, you know, very fortunate individuals. But yet, you know, we certainly do know from the statistics that have been released by the department to show how many people are involved in accidents on our road involving drinking and driving. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the obvious question is why are people drinking and driving on our highways? Why are people not getting the message? Yet our government, the department, the police, MAD Canada, and many different groups throughout our communities 
are involved in an awareness campaign trying to trying and I should say trying and try trying again you know to get that message out that drinking and driving is not allowed on our roads Mr. Speaker, in the past, I've attended uh, some of the kickoff campaigns by Mad Canada, especially at home with the uh, Digby County chapter, in order to try to help get that message out in our own community that drinking and driving is not allowed on our roads. And try, you know, the, these awareness campaigns are great, you know, trying to reach all drivers, trying to reach individuals, families, the general public to get that message out. You know, these awareness campaigns are vital, are critical, but there's never enough of them. You know, especially when you look at these numbers I've just shared, shared with you in order to help make our roads safer. We still have people, you know, getting behind that wheel who have been drinking. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to, to thank the many mad uh, Canada volunteers across Nova Scotia who are trying to get that mass message out. You know, trying to make us understand that drinking and driving don't mix and it's not allowed on our highways. Their, their effort, Mr. Speaker, are certainly not going unnoticed. At the end of the day, if one accident can be prevented, one life can be saved, then we are all grateful for their dedication and hard work. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the amendment that's before the House this afternoon will make it tougher for convicted impaired drivers who choose to drive impaired with children under the age of 16 in their vehicle. If someone is found guilty of such an offense, an additional 12 months will be added on top of their current penalty handed down by the courts. Mr. Speaker, as we're aware, <clears throat> Manitoba is currently the only province to have such penalties. <coughs> Pardon me. Now that Nova Scotia is introducing uh, this change, I suspect other Canadian jurisdictions uh, will be adopting the same policy to protect our children in the near future. So again, Mr. Speaker, this amendment sends a strong message to parents and to other drivers who drink and drive with children in their vehicle. Mr. Speaker, I also understand under this legislation, first-time offenders who are found guilty of drinking and driving with, with children under the age of 16 in their vehicle will be required to participate in the alcohol ignition program. You know, this will force, Mr. Speaker, force first-time offenders to enroll in this alcohol ignition program. Previously, Mr. Speaker, you had to enroll if you were convicted of a second offense. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the alcohol ignition program started back in 2008. You know, this program was put in place to keep our roads safer by reducing the number of people who drink and drive. You know, this program is for people who have lost their driver's license because they have been convicted of an alcohol-related offense. Mr. Speaker, before wrapping up my comments on this bill, I want to take a few minutes here to acknowledge the many drivers on our highways who don't drink and drive, who respect the law. And I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, you have, and I'm sure all my colleagues here in the House have well, notice, you know, individuals throughout their communities as well who are <clears throat> taking precautions uh, before they go out and enjoy themselves. They make sure that they, ha that they have a designated driver to drive while, while others may enjoy themselves. Or yet, you know, they decide to leave their vehicle behind until the next day. So I think it's absolutely critical that we do acknowledge that a lot of our drivers in Nova Scotia are aware 
of the, the situations and are taking precautions. And I think we have to, you know, Mr. Speaker, take a moment to congratulate them. So hopefully more and more drivers in our province will take and make uh, these, uh, these arrangements before they go out and enjoy themselves. But Mr. Speaker, it's important to recognize that many drivers understand and make sure that they don't drink and drive, and they should, and they, like I said, uh, they should be congratulated, congratulated, and I hope, you know, they'll keep on sharing that message with, with other drivers in our province. So, Mr. Speaker, in order to make our roads safer, our legislature, as legislatures, we need to address the seriousness of drinking and driving on our highways. And by supporting these amendments that are before the House, Mr. Speaker, today, it will certainly help address the seriousness of drinking and driving on our roads. And bottom line, it will save lives and it will make our highway safer. But I, I want to certainly end with this. Mr. Speaker, by whatever actions we do take as legislators, protecting children is and should be our highest priority. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise on behalf of the PC caucus to speak in support of this legislation. It seems to us in this quarter of the House that Bill 1 is another step forward in the continued effort to stamp out drunk driving in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, over the last decade or so, there have been a number of substantive forward steps in the never-ending effort to end the dangerous practice of impaired driving. I'm remembering the Alcohol Ignition Interlock Program introduced and implemented in 2008, as well as the introduction of strengthened penalties for driving a motor vehicle with a blood level between 0.05 and 0.08. Years earlier, at the turn of the present century, Operation Christmas was established to reduce impaired driving by folks hitting the road after imbibing generously on various Christmas seasonal social activities. So this bill, Mr. Speaker, will likely reduce impaired driving by a number of people. Parents who might choose to have a little too much at a family and sports promotion activities or fundraisers, which their kids might also attend. It will likely reduce consumption of after-work drinks by parents who have to drive their kids to sports events in the early evening. But perhaps the most significant effect of this bill, Mr. Speaker, will be deterrence of teenagers drinking and driving with someone under 16, friends in their vehicle after parties and social activities. Mr. Speaker, it'll be a great incentive to working parents, young working people, and teenagers who have just received their driver's license to be sensible and to not drink and drive. This bill, Mr. Speaker, should also encourage increased uses of designated drivers. We note that MAD is strongly supportive of this legislation, and we understand and agree with MAD's thinking. <coughs> driving under the influence is a dangerous, dangerous and harmful practice, and it does indeed deserve serious consequences. In addition, Mr. Speaker, Bill 1 follows in the steps of other laws protecting kids, like the law pro prohibiting smoking in vehicles with kids that was passed in 2007. So in closing, Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Conservative Caucus will be voting in favor of this legislation. Thank you. I recognize the uh, government uh, house leader, Okay. My apologies. I, uh, I recognize the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal to close debate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, your apologies accepted. It's good to see the Speaker admit that he did make a mistake like I made earlier. 
Uh, for members, uh, President, and for those watching Ledge TV, uh, this is a perfect example of cooperation on an important piece of legislation. I, I know that members uh, of the Conservative Caucus have, have highlighted the fact that uh, I took the opportunity to recognize uh, the previous minister in this position, Murray Scott. Uh, you know, in the time that I spend in this House, I, I, we look at legislation such as this. Legislation, as the member from Clare makes it very clear, is based on responsibility in protecting children. And I thank him for his comments. The member for, for Victoria the Lake put things, puts things in perspective, and the teenager influence in particular is one that I appreciate you highlighting. It is, after all, a good example of how we have to continually educate young people and people of all ages about how it's just socially unacceptable to drink and drive. I thank you for those examples. I thank the members opposite for their points of view. I'm looking forward to this proceeding on the law amendments. And with those comments, Mr. Speaker, I would move uh, the closure or the uh, bill uh, one, second reading. I recognize the, uh, oh, the, mo uh, the motion is for adjournment of debate. No. Oh, uh, for uh, the close uh, reading of, of second, uh, second reading on bill number one. And the question, all those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. I will now recognize the bill number clerk. one, an act to amend <laughs> chapter 293 of the revised statutes, 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. This uh, bill will now uh, move to uh, law amendments. Yeah. I do recognize the uh, Honorable Government uh, House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, long away to put a thank to you. I appreciate it. Mr. Speaker, that includes, or we all well, have a problem with their tongues today, Mr. Speaker. That concludes uh, the government's uh, business for today, and uh, I would now hand it over to the official opposition's House Leader for Business for Opposition Day. I uh, recognize uh, the Honourable uh, House Leader for the official opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the House will meet tomorrow from the hours of 2 o'clock to 6 p.m., and following the daily routine and question period, uh, we'll be calling resolution number 134 and resolution number 8. Mr. Speaker, I move that we do now adjourn. Until the motion uh, before the House uh, is that we rise to meet tomorrow between the hours of 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. All those in favour? Those opposed? Motion is carried. We have now reached the moment of interruption. Subject for tonight's late debate was submitted by the member for Kings West. And, and therefore, uh, be resolved that with today's announcement of uh, last year's surplus, the NDP government explained to the people of Yarmouth and southwestern Nova Scotia why they couldn't provide the needed $3 million to sustain the Yarmouth to New England Ferry for one more year. Keep this economic driver alive and help people and business coming into the province. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is truly an honor to stand in my place and talk about this important issue, uh, the Yarmouth Ferry issue. It's an issue that I hear about every day in my constituency. I will uh, respond to the Minister's comments earlier in question period about collaboration and working together and respect. And I want to assure the Minister um, that I am a member who, despite my critiques of some decisions that this government has made, will always be a member, as the member from Pictou East knows, uh, who is willing to collaborate with all members of this House when it comes to doing good things for Nova Scotians. But Mr. Speaker, I will, I will tell you that if the minister keeps it up the way he's acting in question period, he'll be pushing it. <laughs> no, but it, uh, this, is, this is a very important issue for, uh, for, for my constituency in Yarmouth, as you, as you well know. Uh, and I think it's important to review the facts of what's happened here, Mr. Speaker. In 2009, Yarmouth was hit with a decision that this government would be stopping subsidy to our ferry link. Immediately, effective immediately. That uh, original uh, investment would have costed this province $9 million, but if you look at the numbers, 
it actually would have been $3 million to keep that ferry service going for one more year. And that's all, all that the community wanted, was to have one more year with the CAT so that we could transition and get a new service in place while maintaining that essential economic sea link to the United States, our greatest trading partner and their national friend. $9 million it would have cost in the original subsidy. Three, three million of that, Mr. Speaker, if you review the math, the government would have to pay anyway to cancel the contract. So you're looking at $6 million. The municipalities came up with half of that, Mr. Speaker, half of that. They came up with $3 million. They went back to the Premier and said, we'll provide this $3 million if you match it. It would have costed this government $3 million to ensure that that service was existing for one more year in your arm. And that, Order. that wasn't Order. even... We could have it a little uh, quieter for uh, late debate, this very important topic before the House. I recognize the uh, member for Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You know, $3 million to ensure that that economic engine in southwest Nova Scotia would be going for another year. $3 million to ensure that those 100 years that as a province we educated people, our, our American friends on the U.S. side of the border, for 100 years we educated them to come through Yarmouth. It would have costed $3 million to keep that going. Instead, we, we've thrown that away. In two years, we've thrown those 100 years of education away. We've told people in the last two years, you know what? You don't come through Yarmouth anymore. You drive all around if you come at all. All the way around if you come at all. And, you know, Mr. Speaker, I've seen firsthand the consequences in my constituency because of that decision. 300 people, according to the municipality of Yarmouth, the town of Yarmouth, lost their jobs as a direct result of that ferry. 300 people. Businesses have been closing. That's no joke. It's actually happening. You know, I, hear, I hear on the government side that I don't know the full story. I don't know the full story that, that uh, you know, dictated their decision. That's true because they haven't brought any of that information to the House to debate. They haven't presented any information, any evidence to support that decision. So I might not know the whole story. But I do know the story and the many stories of my constituents, Mr. Speaker, who are struggling right now, who are worried right now. The story of Bill Curry, who had a tourism operation for 100 years, Mr. Speaker, a family company that existed for 100 years this past year closed. They shut down after 100 years. 100 year family tradition shut down because of that decision. I know that the uh, 20 people that are out of work now at the, the Mothball Colony Inn, Yarmouth's second largest hotel, I know their story. They're out of work, wondering what they're going to do in Yarmouth. You know, Captain Kelly's, a long standing restaurant in Yarmouth, shut their doors. Another 20 people out of work. The list goes on of the businesses that have, that have been affected by this. It's not just tourism. You know, the tourism operators have been hurt the most by this decision. Of course they're going to be hurt when you, you cut off 75,000 people coming through your community a year. That's going to hurt. But it's the economic spin-offs that have really impacted the area. And it's had such an impact. I think the, the worst impact it's had is on the, the psyche and morale of that community. Many people in that community are concerned. They feel hopeless. They don't feel that they have the partner they should have in government. A partner that during hard, difficult times stands with them and helps move them forward. They're not giving up. You know, they feel that they've had a, a government that has actually set them back. And I think that's true. I know that the members of the government will stand up and boast about tourism numbers being up this, for these past, uh, this past year, 3% or something like that. You know, I think those numbers are inflated um, because of the cruise ships that come into Halifax Harbor that don't stay overnight, that don't fill the rooms. And I also think they're inflated because I believe that the tourism department is counting every single person that comes in and out of the province as a tourist, whether it's the premier, myself, any Nova Scotian, my family members that leave and come back, I think they're being included in that as well. Because if you look at the, the room accommodation numbers and tourism numbers for Southwest Nova, they are down. Yarmouth and Acadian Shores, down, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Occupancy rates down in Yarmouth and Acadian Shores. And visitations from New England down. These are the facts. These are from the uh, these are from from the department. These numbers are down, and the 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 situation is so dire that churches in Yarmouth have started to voice their concerns about what's going on. 
the Protestant ministerial, representing Protestant churches from across the, the, uh, the county of Yarmouth, sent a letter to the Premier letting him know of the urgency of the situation in Yarmouth. Letting him know that people are struggling, that their numbers of, of clients that come in looking for help because they don't have money, they don't know what to do, have increased. And the Catholics followed suit, Mr. Speaker, sending a letter of their own because their services for the community are being used a lot more than before. And those church groups have associated that increase in need in our community to the loss of the ferry service. That's happened. Everybody associates it with that. And yeah, God's involved now. Yeah, the NDP have brought God into the whole thing. Huh? Who knows what's going to happen now? Um, but Mr. Speaker, you know, you, you hear that things are fine and everything's dandy, but you don't hear from this government the stories of all the people that have been affected by this. And, you know, to hear the throne speech this past week, mention Yarmouth, you know, I appreciated that, and Yarmouth's 250th celebrations. Uh, you know, this government continually mentions the $400,000 they put into their Explorer Shores campaign and talk about how much support they're providing for West Nova and Yarmouth. And there has been some monies um, come in, you know, $150,000, I believe, for, for the 250th anniversary, $400,000 for Explorer Shores campaign. But if you look at the results that those investments are, are, uh, are bringing about, there isn't any. Occupancy rates have still gone down, businesses have still closed, and there's been no indication from anybody in the tourism industry that these investments are doing something to improve their situation. And the reason they're not is because we've cut off a sea link to one of the biggest markets in the world, in New England. One of the biggest markets in the world. We looked at that, the government looked at that and said, you know, we don't need that. We don't need to connect ourselves to our greatest international partner and friend, the U.S. We don't need to have that direct sea link with the closest port in Nova Scotia to the closest port in New England. We don't need to have that. There's no business case for it, is what they said. But then we learn afterwards, after the fact, from the Chambers of Commerce from southwestern Nova Scotia, that there is, in fact, a business case for this. According to them, this is the only cost-benefit analysis that has been done and that has been presented to this House. A $6 million annual investment in the Yarmouth Ferry would have yielded over $22 million in profits for Nova Scotians leading up to, to 2015. 22 million in profits that have been lost because of that one decision. And we feel it most distinctly in Yarmouth. You know, I, I, can, I was told, you know, I'm told that I don't, you know, these aren't, these aren't the, this isn't necessarily the case and that I might not know all my facts and that, you know, as a government, they did their homework. But Mr. Speaker, I look out across the, uh, the benches opposite and I see a lot of teachers and they know that your homework's only good if you bring it to class. Your homework's only good if you bring it to class and share it with everybody else. That's right. You know? No one has been given any indication why this decision was made, which leads me to think it was a political decision. Not one based on business. Not one based on any cost-benefit analysis by, lo by looking at the, the spin-offs in the economy by having that, that C-Link. And definitely not one that considered the interests of our tourism operators and small business owners who needed the business from that vessel. I've talked with, with tourism operators, of course, across Yarmouth. We've consulted with them numerous times. I've talked to them in Queens County, in Shelburne, in Hubbards. They're all saying the same thing. We've been hurt by this decision. Order. Order. That was quick. <laughs> I recognize the <laughs> I recognize the honorable member for Argyle. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I wish uh, I wish the member for for Yarmouth would have had a little more time to uh, to finish off his speech. But 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, we're going to get to speak about this uh, many times. Uh, over the next number of months, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I think um, that the government 
uh, feels that uh, this, is, this story is getting old and they would like to move on from it and maybe they're getting tired of hearing um, us from Yarmouth County uh, talking about it uh, on, on, on every occasion possible. And I can say that uh, as the uh, MLA for Yarmouth, or the MLA for Argyle, uh, along with the MLA for Yarmouth, that we'll talk about this uh, at any opportunity that we have the opportunity to talk about it. Because we see the impact of this bad decision um, every time that we travel through our constituencies. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member uh, from Yarmouth was talking about um, how now the, the, the churches or the church associations have now um, gotten involved uh, in writing letters uh, to the Premier and writing letters to the communities uh, talking about what they're seeing as impact uh, to their uh, to their constituents. You know, Mr. Uh, Speaker, what happens a lot is after all government funding uh, is, is expired, you know, you lose your EI, um, you end up on, on uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the welfare rolls of this province. Um, that doesn't give you enough to live. And in some cases, people don't even qualify uh, for uh, income support. So they fall to their churches um, like, uh, like the Sally Ann, like the Salvation Army, in order to help them uh, survive those days. And what those churches have seen, what those pastors have seen, what those congregations have seen, uh, they've seen uh, uh, an increase uh, in people looking for help because they're, they're desperate. They, they don't know where to turn to uh, now that we're almost two years uh, from where we were uh, when we did have that kind of tourist, tourist system uh, in southwest Nova Scotia. The other unfortunate part that's created by desperation, and I, and I, and I, and I alerted a little bit to it in my in speech and reply last night, is organizations and people who, you know, in my mind, don't have all the details, don't have all the information required, can stand up and say, everything will be okay, I just need a X amount, of, X amount of dollars and I can provide you with a ferry service that can start this summer. Hallelujah. Well, you know what? That's the thing we don't need to have happen in, in Southwest Nova Scotia is fly by night showing up and taking everybody's money and screwing it up and not having a service uh, into the future. We've got one shot at this, I, I believe in getting the right service into Yarmouth. Because I, I am, the, of course, the eternal optimist, making sure uh, that, that, that Southwest Nova Scotia will be having a ferry service in the future. And that ferry service will be a, a, a sustainable system that will be able to, to run its own, on its own auspices. Uh, it'll be the right boat in the right place going to the right place. It will be able to provide and, uh, and, and make money on board. It will be able to take freight. You know, we, we can go on to the things that we believe that it needs to be to be a viable system. And I'm sure at some point, there'll be somebody that will come knocking at the door of government and saying, listen, you know, we've got some infrastructure needs. We have some marketing needs in order to get running. And I want to be able to hear from, from the government once again that they'll be there, that their door is open. You know, we go back to, during question period, the member for Yarmouth talked about the $3 million. And uh, I, I, was, I was a little put back by, by looking at the members um, on the front bench that were saying, well, what do you mean? They, they were actually were, I think, confused in what uh, the member was, was bringing forward. And that during all of this kerfuffle that's been created in, the, in Southwest Nova Scotia, uh, the municipalities, in conjunction with the federal government, were able to come up with a $3 million item and say, listen, we have $3 million um, to partner with you to maintain that service into 2011. Or 2010, sorry. But it seemed that it fell on deaf ears, and now I think we understand why it fell on deaf ears, because really nobody else knew about it except for the Premier. Uh, the letter was sent directly for the Premier that this, this amount of money was available, and, you know, here we are almost a year and a half later, and, and people really didn't even know about it. It's not the fact that someone finally said, this is the wrong ferry, this is the wrong service. You know, it's been coming for some time. 
What we do disagree with is the, is the way that Yarmouth and Yarmouth County was treated in this. It was, we're done, doors closed, forget it. When really what any compassionate government should have done, would have done, is provided a transition to that area to find the service that it did need, that it still needs and will continue to need. I thank the Minister of Tourism for coming to Yarmouth, uh, for, for his thoughts and concentration on, on what could happen, what might happen, on trying to market the area as a premium destination. But how can it be a premium destination when people still can't get there? You know, the majority of people that came to that area came by boat. They came from the largest market in almost the whole world, which is the U.S. and the eastern seaboard. To have them come and spend their dollars in southwest Nova Scotia was, I think, uh, phenomenal. Look at the 23 or $22 million economic activity that was created by an investment of $6 million. That is something that is, is, is laudable. It's something that is important to, to a community to have that kind of economic impact uh, happening to it. But we're seeing people losing their jobs. You know, we, we've talked to the 300, 300 people that have lost their jobs. We're talking about businesses that are closing. I mean, I look at right now uh, my friend Calvin, uh, Calvin Dontremo, who runs uh, a Day by the Sea uh, tours. Um, he's, you know, seriously considering selling his van and, and getting out of the business completely. You know, because, because he lost his biggest market, which was sitting, at, sitting uh, at, the, at the terminal, picking up a number of people, bringing them on a day tour around the area, showing off the Acadian culture, showing them off our beautiful vistas, and returning them to the cat so that they could uh, keep on their way. But he's, for all, sen uh, you know, for all, all, you know, all uh, intents. intents and purposes, thank you, I don't know why I'm not getting that word, but he's selling, he's selling his facility. He's selling his, his truck so he can no longer do it. So we're losing that infrastructure. I mean, the colony is another symptom of that larger piece is that, you know, they're closing their doors. They're closed. They're not open. We we're lucky to see that they can turn it over quickly and open it up. But that's for one year. What happens after year two if we, if we are not successful in getting that boat in place? We'll continue to lose some of that infrastructure that's so, so important to us. But again, being the, the optimist, um, you know, and in the information that I continue to hear, that continue to hear uh, from the people that are involved. I'm not involved in this, you know, because the way we looked at it from the community, that you had to have a person that was sort of the main contact point. The municipalities agreed through their industrial commission that the industrial commission would be the person or the organization that would take in the request for proposals, that would go out and look for a boat who would have the asset of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the terminal that sits in Yarmouth so that they can go and say, here is the package to come to, to Yarmouth. Here's some of the supports that will go along with it. And from everything that we continue to hear, that there is interest in it. There is interest for the 2012 uh, season. And, uh, and all I can hope, all I can hope, and this is what I, what I ask, is with all these great talks of surpluses over the last couple of days, is, you know, can you find it somewhere in there to provide some real dollars when organizations come knocking at the door uh, looking for support? And again, like I said, it's support for marketing, it's support for setup. It's maybe that first or year or two years that they're going to need that kind of help. Because what has happened now, we have no service, people know there's no service, so they're not going to be going to look for it for a long time unless we market it and get it set up. So again, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity for, for speaking to this again. I look forward to the comments uh, from the Minister of uh, Tourism. Thank you very much. I recognize the, uh, the Minister for Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I will... I will start my comments by uh, the comment that I will make is I'll try to keep this as positive as, as possible and not, uh, not resort to any uh, schoolyard tactics. Um, I, um, I'm pleased, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, rise today to discuss the uh, government's decision regarding the Yarmouth Ferry Service. 
This is not the first time I have uh, I've been asked about this decision, and I've heard that it's not going to be the last. But let me assure you, Mr. Speaker, the thought process behind this decision has not changed. The bottom line is, one could argue, surplus or deficit. One more year or 10 more years. The ferry simply was not sustainable in the long run. There was no business case, and we did what was in the best interests of all Nova Scotians. This was not a matter of spending $3 million, as it has been suggested by some. The province spent tens of millions of dollars to support the Yarmouth Ferry. Yet, money kept going, business didn't increase, there was a steady decline in the number of passengers, costs were rising, tens of millions of dollars, and we couldn't stop those things from happening. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the ferry service was a victim of a number of things. One, the fluctuating dollar, rising gas prices, and a shift in the U.S. economy, not to mention a change in the pattern of those visitors coming from the United States. To be very specific, Mr. Speaker, a 40% change in the value of the U.S. dollars since 2002 seriously impacted ferry revenues that are, or were at that time, in U.S. funds. Fuel prices have gone from 68 cents per liter in 2004 to $1.20 cents a liter, and Mr. Speaker, we know that they continue to rise. The price of a family of four with a vehicle to travel on the cat to Maine and back costs more than $1,070 U.S. Tightening U.S. security has meant changes in family travel plans and patterns. In fact, Mr. Speaker, vehicle traffic from Yarmouth to the U.S decreased by 71% from 2000 to 2009, while the cost of operating increased significantly. In 2009, just over 1% of visitors to the province, I'll reiterate that, just over 1% of visitors to the province used Yarmouth as their entry point. This equates to just over 26,000 people of an estimated total of over 2 million visitors to Nova Scotia. In its last four years of operation, Bay Ferries had to rely heavily on government subsidized subsidies to keep its operation going. This included over $21 million in subsidies from the province of Nova Scotia. Those subsidies did not help to make Bay Ferry stronger in the face of growing challenges, didn't help a bit. In fact, the company's need for government assistance was growing at a time when we are required to work hard and make the tough decisions that will get Nova Scotia back to balance. Mr. Speaker, we are not the only ones who think this was the case. In 2010, transportation study of the Southwest region, commissioned by ACOA, clearly agreed with us. Government's decision concerning the CAT theory was a tough decision. It was thought out. It was deliberate. It had been under consideration for years. The results of this study reaffirm that government made a tough, a tough choice, a business choice, not a political choice, Mr. Speaker. 
There is no new information that I'm aware of to support a business case for a Yarmouth U.S. ferry service. And while the bottom line is that the ferry was unsustainable, that certainly isn't the case for Yarmouth itself, Mr. Speaker. That's why I am pleased to have this opportunity to speak to this government's commitment to make life better for families in Yarmouth, southwestern Nova Scotia, and every region of the province. This government continues to support projects that are creating good jobs and growing the economy in and around Yarmouth. And the province is actively supporting municipal efforts to create a new regional development authority. You see, Mr. Speaker, I see this, this government sees this as an opportunity to focus on the future, not to dwell on the past. I will take this opportunity to share with you what the province is doing to work with stakeholders in, in, in business. The tourism sector and other levels of government to create new opportunities, new opportunities for growth, new opportunities for success in this particular region of the province. Since June of 2009, the province has worked diligently to create jobs in southwest Nova Scotia. This involves dozens of projects well worth well worth over $13 million. And do you know what, Mr. Speaker? I'm going to point out a few examples. We have invested $8.8 million to restore infrastructure in the Shelburne ship repair. 8.8. These improvements to the Marine Railway in war have allowed the company to resume building and repairing ships and will employ up to 45 employees during peak periods. My department has given $2.5 million, a loan guarantee to D.B. Kennedy, Kenny Fisheries. It's an investment in an opportunity in an important seafood processor in southwestern Nova Scotia. This family-run business employs 70 people and processes and transports local seafood to domestic and international markets around the world. It also generates businesses for many local fishermen in their crews. And excuse me, Mr. Speaker, I, I should have said fisher persons. We are investing in technology and innovation by helping JHS fish products take recycling to the next level. The company is taking fish parts that would not normally be used in North America and turning them into a commodity, commodity using a drying machinery. Dried fish products are a dietary staple in southern Nigeria. Our $1.8 million investment in the Tuscat-based company has supported plans to create up to 50 jobs. Think about tourism, Mr. Speaker. We have been just as aggressive pursuing economic opportunities for Yarmouth in the southwest region. We work closely with Destination Southwest Nova Scotia Previous investments have enabled stakeholders in Southwest Nova Scotia to enhance their tourism opportunities. We will continue with that. Mr. Order, Speaker. Order. The Honourable Member's time has expired. That, con that concludes uh, the business of, uh, of the House for today. And uh, the hours uh, have been set for tomorrow. At, uh, we'll resume at 2 p.m. So the House now stands adjourned.